Total decompression again, and, and those who answer will be rewarded. So, number one, where do we do it? Second and Costco. We do it midclavicular in our protocols. Now, seven years ago, we did not do it midclavicular. We did it mid axillary, and then five years before that, we did it midclavicular. So we went from here to here to here. Do you know why, Priscilla? No. Because when we were here, somebody accidentally made a mistake and plural decompressed about right here, oh, and went right into the heart. All right. And, and then what happened when we were in here? Somebody plural decompressed a little too low. Mm -hmm. and, and, a and a little yeah. liver biopsy, so now we're back up to here. <laughs> so uh, now, when do we plural decompress? Trauma. Okay. Yeah. So we got uh, tension pneumothorax. All right, tension pneumothorax. Now, is there a time when they may not have a tension pneumothorax we do this? Trauma arrest. To all trauma arrest. Why? Practice. 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 The chances of somebody surviving a cardiac arrest trauma, which this guy was close to cardiac arrest trauma at one time, are less than one half of one percent. And the number one cause of death other than that is blunt trauma to the chest and the abdomen, and especially the chest. So on the remote chance that they have bilateral tension pneumothorax cause their trauma arrest, we can relieve that. And if not, then it is just a little bit of a practice because the first time you poke this in somebody's chest, I, don't, I would rather be on a trauma arrest than on a live, awake, alert, and oriented person that has a tension pneumothorax that needs it bad. And you're going to be looking at them and say, this is going to hurt me the more than it's going to hurt you, and you're doing this. And I'm trying to get it in them. So that's why. We don't get caught with trauma arrest very often. We get a trauma alert. Med flight can't fly for whatever reason, whether we're on the way to the hospital, they go into trauma arrest, and we plural decompress both sides. Okay? Now, goes between what ribs? Second and third. Second and third. Second and third. How do we find the second and third? Start at the, the clavicle. Okay, clavicle is the first rib, and you go down. Now, some people have more muscle and or fat up here, so it may be a little difficult. What are some of the other landmarks that we can use other than the clavicle and trying to find the intercostal spaces exactly? What other, what other landmarks can we use? Ooh, not everybody knows. No, nope, sternal notch is not a good one. The angle of Lewis. It's, the, it's a ridge that runs across your sternum sideways, and that is where the second rib always joins the sternum. Everybody feel this one. Just go up and down. Yeah, that's, a, that's an angle of Lewis. Can't miss it. No, not on the side. It's got to be right in the center of the sternum is what you're looking for. There? That, that ridge that goes across the sternum. That is up and down. We're feeling right in the middle of the sternum. That is where the second rib always joins the sternum. So if that's the second rib, we go across and then go between the second and third rib. Okay? All right, listen up again. When we go between the rib, on top the third or below the second? Top of the third. Oh, between the second and third. Between the I know, and third. we're going between the second and third, but is it on top of third? All right, here's a way to remember it. If you want to keep your patient on top the ground, i.e. alive, you put it on top the rib. If you want to put them under the ground, you go under the rib. If you want to kill them, you go underneath that second rib. But if you want to keep them above the ground, you go on top of the third. Okay, makes sense? All right. Uh, Mid-clavicular, uh, mid-axillary, where do we put it? Fourth and fifth. Between the fourth and fifth. Where are my landmarks there? A little bit more difficult. You got a nipple line. You got a nipple line. That's correct. Your nipple is usually about the fourth rib, maybe the fourth or fifth rib. Now, if people get realistic. If it's grandma, we're not going to be poking her here. <laughs> the it's where her nipple line should be. Okay. Where an anatomically norm be. If she's had a boob job and they're sort of out there like this, you take the difference of the two, I guess. I don't know. But between the fourth and fifth. Okay. So we use the nipple line. Or I can still use the angle of Lewis. That's my second. And I work my way down. I'll go right across the nipple to get to it. All right. So, is there a time in our protocol that we can do mid-axillary and never fear for repercussion? Absolutely, we can do it any time you want. I, I, I'll say it, and I'll say it a million times, and Marty said it a million times when I was out in the field that you can do anything you want outside that protocol as long as what you can justify, you know, justify it. You can justify it. So, if this guy's got a bad burn and/or hamburger meat up here, and I just can't get it, and I need it. I'm going to go mid-axillary, I'm going to document it, and nothing will ever be done. Nothing will ever be done. If you say I did it just because I felt like it, then, then we've got a problem. You know? But if you can justify it, if you can got somebody with such severe hypertension and the docs don't like our medicine, you've got Lasix, you've got all sorts of medicines that will lower blood pressure. And if you can justify it, then you're not going to get in trouble. All right? Makes sense? All right. Uh, so with that... Uh, okay, so we go in, we find our landmark, we go on top of the third rib. What are we really supposed to do? 
We're supposed to have this syringe on here. Why? So it shows the bubbles. Do we need to see the bubbles? No. What are we really looking for? Blood. blood. If there's blood in there, what are we going to do? Dr. Tober's a little scared, so he's going to assume what? That we did something wrong, so we're going to do this, and then what are we going to do? Plug it off. We don't want it to bleed. Now, if it's a true hemothorax, what are they going to do when they get to the hospital? Put a chest tube in and pull that blood out. they got to pull it out just like air because it, it's taking up space it shouldn't be taking up. But he's afraid we might have done something wrong, so we're just going to cap it and leave it. So we're really not looking for air with this. We're actually looking for blood. So if we didn't put this on and we started just with our catheter, found our landmarks, seeing how I'm being filmed, I'll try to do it somewhat right. So I go find my landmarks, angle Lewis, come over between second and third, angle it on top of the third and go in. So what, it, what I, I should hear air. Many times that tension's been so bad that this catheter has actually flown out of there and hit the ceiling. That, that The tension in there is so much. If not, it's going to raise it up and you're going to hear, and the patient, if they're awake, you're going to go, oh, thank you. Thank you, that's so much better. Now what are we supposed to do with it? Cap it. Cap it. Okay, now this is very, very very dangerous. Why? Create tension. Why did I poke their chest to begin with? To get the air out. And now what did I do? I closed it back off. I needed to create an outlet for the air that's trapped inside this chest cavity. And I did that and now I just closed that outlet off. So if you're not going to keep a pair of eyes on your patient and ears on the, their, their chest, you have now created an outlet to kill them again or possibly kill them again. So you need to listen to lung sounds and pay attention to your patient's breathing habits. And if it gets worse, you let the air out again. To me, what I probably would wind up like, oopsie, you know, because a sucking chest wound will not kill anybody, people. It cannot build into a tension if air gets sucked in and gets pushed out with each breath. Tell that to EMT students. You've got a laceration here and you've got a sucking chest wound. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put an occlusive dressing on it and seal it. Now, that three sides thing is all well and fine, but you're not going to find anything that flimsy that will breathe in the uh, every time there's a little air in there. Plus, you can't tape anything down anyway because they're sweaty and bloody. You know, so that, that taping on three sides theory doesn't work. So you put an occlusive dressing on there and you just have created the ability to kill a patient. Because instead of a sucking chest wound and a little pneumothorax, they now have a sealed chest cavity and it's going to be a tension pneumothorax push over against the heart and it's going to kill them. So if you're not going to keep eyes and ears on your patient, don't seal it. Don't seal it. Make sense? So, but what our protocol says, we're going to seal this. And then every minute or so, if they're getting it a little bit more difficult, breathing, up, and let it out. Questions? Yeah, Book some chest. What's going on? How are you going to remember? That's why mine accidentally go like, oopsie, yeah. oopsie. And the flutter valve, well, you know, we used to use take a glove of a finger and cut it. Again, works in theory, but it's not that flimsy enough to where they take a breath in. The, the, the flutter valve will stop the air from going inside of it, and then when they breathe out, the air will come out. It, it's nice in theory, but it doesn't work perfectly that way. So, uh, Priscilla, if you're letting the air go in and out, I guarantee you more air is going to come out than is going in if they have a damaged lung. And, and trust me, one poke of the chest for tension pneumothorax is not enough to say, oh, look there, we fixed the problem, they can go home now. That lung is still damaged, and it's going to still leak every breath they take. And it's going to continue to leak for four or five days, maybe, depending on how bad that lung is. So they're going to buy a chest tube for four or five days and constantly be pulling negative pressure in there and allowing that to leak before it can seal off and heal itself. They may have to go in there and cauterize it or something. But it's going to leak, so just one poke, oh, look, we're good for the next five days. No, it, it, it's going to build up in a few more minutes. You're going to need to relieve it again. Okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, poke the chest. Gra gra grab a spot. You're not going to kill them going underneath the second rib, but that's where all your major vessels and nerves run. So it, it's going to create complications for them later on. And everything else. So a lot of people are now really teaching to go in at this angle and then really and then flip it once they're just they, they say hit the rib almost, go up over it and then just stay on top of it. That's how I was talking. Let's say I had someone that was severely, severely obese. And I didn't think this two inch needle was gonna get into their chest cavity, what would I do? So what I would do is really push down on the fat and, and move it out of the way. I, I would make that much fat turn into this much fat by just pressing on it. And then, then I would find my landmark, and I would sit here and push on this needle, and really compress that, and I would get a 